Can you hear me? Yes? Uh, uh, mein Deutsch ist sehr schlecht, so I am going to speak to you in English, and I'll try and speak uh, slowly. Um, uh, I'm actually going to talk to you about not quite what's been announced, but something very close to it. <laughs> you know how it is. I, I am writing a, a, a book uh, called The Open City, which is an attempt to translate some ideas of open systems theory into our understanding of urban design, and how cities are constructed. Um, I mean, I'm an amateur systems analyst. I, I'm really interested in it, uh, but I'm not an expert uh, from it. But I'm trying to understand this application because I think what's happening to cities today is that they're becoming closed systems. And that as a result, we're losing not only freedom uh, in the city, but also our experience is being flattened out, infantilized, becoming much more one-dimensional. Uh, and the general question I have about this is what, if anything, open systems thinking uh, could do to get us out of this closure. But it's also for me a very specific thing about um, how we can make smart cities that are actually empowering for people rather than repressing for uh, them. Because most of the smart city design that's being sold very profitably uh, is something that tends to close the city in. It, there are systems of control rather than enablement. And to me, the question is, how can we better use the, uh, the technology that we have at, our, at hand? How can we make use of big data, in particular, to empower people rather than to disempower them? So that's basically what I'd like to talk to you about. I hope you've all brought sleeping bags and mattresses, because I go on at some length. Uh, but I'll stop after 45 minutes and maybe we, we can have some kind of uh, discussion. I didn't realize there were going to be so many people here. Um, the signs of the most familiar sign of cities becoming closed systems is in their, uh, the homogeneity of built urban form, uh, that it's harder and harder to know when, as a plane lands, uh, whether you're in Frankfurt or in Shanghai. And the reason for that is that the, what globalization has done to the built form of the city has essentially standardized the kinds of building uh, typologies that are used uh, globally. And I'll tell you exactly how that works. There are two kinds of investment in uh, foreign investment in, um, in uh, city infrastructure. One of them is called opportunity investing where somebody outside sees an opportunity that people inside have not seen before or can mobilize the cash to seize a, uh, uh, an undervalued asset in the city uh, uh, with, enough, with enough financial backing so that locals are displaced. The other kind of investing is what's called core investing. And this is where the closure of the city really comes into play, which is that what you're buying is not built form 
but space and specifications. And this is how in this huge urban explosion which is happening today around the world, most of the building uh, is occurring uh, to making cities. Somebody in Kuala Lumpur says, I think I want to invest in India. And I want to buy a building of, say, 40 stories. And I want, say, grade B um, uh, 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 building quality. Uh, and I want to buy so many square feet. Um, because that's what I can find as a land space. Uh, that means that those specifications, if it doesn't work out in Delhi, you'll go to Rio de Janeiro. You're looking to make what's called a core investment. And it's a closed system in the sense that it's not reactive to anything locally on the ground. It's only reactive to the available territory that you can buy. And this core investing has overtaken opportunity investing, which is the way cities developed uh, in uh, much of America and some parts of Europe uh, up to the 1980s. Core investing is now um, uh, the dominant mode of developing a city. And since you're buying specs, rather than buying a building. You might get the building a little applique, a little Zaha Hadid squiggle on the surface, a Frank Gehry uh, angled roof and so on. But the basics of the building have come out of a drawer, or rather they've come off a computer screen, and they can be applied anywhere. And that is a fundamental way in which economic closure works in this in the city. You get closed forms which are not reactive to the environment in which they're set. I don't want to say anything about Berlin, but uh, you, unfortunately, were one of the prime examples in the 90s of uh, core investing. And that's why, well, as I say, I don't want to say anything more about that. Um, so that, that's a physical sign of a closed system. It's non-reactive to its circumstances. There's no feedback into the nature of the form from what the place is. Socially, a closed system also has some familiar and some unfamiliar uh, elements. Uh, a closed system is one in which the inequalities uh, that people uh, experience are segregated. That is to, to say that what you don't have in a closed economic system is, say, working classes and middle classes interacting with each other, struggling with each other, conflict, and so on. The reason you don't have this in cities is that they're more and more segregated. Uh, the idea of a closed urban system uh, turns to the notion of, a so of an economic and also social silo. That when differences exist, those differences are separated. Because what you are afraid of is that in interacting you might get, God forbid, you might get um, a protest you might get daily encounters on the streets that were uncomfortable and so on. So that kind of closure in a closed system is that when there's a potential source of conflict, as in inequality, that the sources of conflict are separated uh, spatially. Um, what we are n know today in Europe and in the United States is that that process of segregation is also creating a very stagnant economy for people on the bottom. 
You know, we make a great error in cities in focusing on the top 1%, because it's actually about 20% of in London, where Saskia and I live, or in uh, New York, it's the, really the top 20% that has prospered by urban conditions. The bottom 80% get nothing from the city. And so what you really have, I mean, it's obscene that people got, you know, the 1% the is obscene, they should all be in jail. But putting that aside, the real issue is that the top 20% are in a very dynamic economic uh, and social situation, whereas the bottom 80% are in a stagnant situation. And that is part of what happens in a closed system, which is that it has differentials of entropy in which gradually the entropic um, uh, zones of the closed system become bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what we're seeing in modern cities today. So by, just to sum this up, by a closed system in a city, I mean something that is homogenized due to core financing. I mean, some, I mean a social system and an economic system in which when there's potentials for conflict, that the answer to that is to segregate and silo the different groups, moving them as far apart from each other as possible. And that thirdly, in a closed system, entropy gradually spreads to larger and larger groups of people. And that's what we have today. This is also age graded too. There's more entropy, most of you look like you're in their 20s. You're in a more entropic uh, age cohort than people like Saskia and me who are ancient, you know. Um, there is actually more economic and social dynamism uh, in the old than it is with young people. And that, so this, this is the menace. So what would an open system look like? Um, a great error that people make in thinking about open systems is that there basically anything goes, that open means unstructured. And in fact, that's exact, hello, <laughs> that's exactly not the case. An open system is a way of organizing uh, certain aspects of behavior uh, and certain ways of, of, of distribution. The essence of an open system is that it creates complexity. Uh, mathematically, you can understand this as the fact that synergies occur in an open system, whereas in a closed system, you only have additive uh, uh, elements. Two plus two equals four. In an open, in, in a closed system, in an open system, as the mathematician Stephen Stuggart describes it, two plus two equals more than four because the parts are interacting with each other. And they're interacting, what synergy means is that their relationships become more and more complicated. Uh, between them. So for instance, if you made an urban analogy to this, uh, if you really mixed, if you put Kreuzberg, and, uh, not Kreuzberg, but Neukölln and, and Savigny Platz together, if you had a system that uh, combined those social and economic groups together, that what would be produced in public, in public places, is something that could not be reduced to either uh, Neukölln or to Savigny Platz. Something would interact and create a greater, um, uh, a greater whole. That's a basic idea of a public sphere, or according to me. Not according to Jürgen Habermas, but according to me, 
what happens in a public sphere is that you have complexity produced uh, by the adjacency of unlike uh, elements. Uh, so that's a first aspect of what an open city would look like. It would be mixed in such a way that things got, uh, got more complicated. You would have synergies, particularly in the public realm. The second aspect of it is that an open system always has ambiguous edges. Now, if you think back to um, your biology class, uh, in school, you remember that edges in natural environments come in two forms. They're either boundaries or borders. And at a boundary, uh, things die out. In the natural world, for instance, a territory where tigers, you know, poop around the edges of the territory to say, enter this at your peril, is a boundary. So is... Um, a, a nation state that requires um, a passport at the frontier. Those, the edge is a source of, of diminished energy and interaction. Whereas in a border, uh, at the edges of territories is where there's heightened interaction. You can see this in the natural world, for instance, even in something as simple as the the, where the, the land meets the water, the uh, seashore. That's where species feed off of each other in that condition. Uh, that's where you have the fastest rates of evolutionary change and so on. You have something where the edge is a realm of heightened activity uh, rather than diminished activity. And what that means, I'm convinced, in the urban realm, is that what we want to do to open up a system is to accentuate the border condition, which is a kind of, uh, which is a kind of intensity in the meeting grounds between uh, different kinds of functions as well as different kinds of people. It would, a border condition in the city would be putting an AIDS hospice in the middle of a shopping center, putting a school and a hospital together, putting a mosque next door to a Catholic church or even a convenience store in the middle of both. It's a notion of blurring the edge and what that means for planners is that you're privileging the ambiguity of space. That is, what you want to do is create more and more ambiguity, not to have more and more definition. And for us, this translates into a very differential relationship between the center and the edge. I'll give you an example of this is my own planning practice. I made a terrible error in the 1980s. I was working on a, a project to create a, a market in Spanish Harlem, which is, uh, was in the 80s and still is, one of the poorest parts of New York, mostly inhabited by uh, um, Hispanics from Mexico and, uh, no, not from Mexico, from Puerto Rico and from Central America. Spanish Harlem lies just above one of the richest parts of, of New York City and indeed of the world called the Upper West Side, Fifth Avenue, Park Avenue, all of that. And in the 80s, there was an, um, a street called 96th Street, which was a kind of absolute boundary between them. People from the Upper East Side never went into uh, Spanish Harlem. And Spanish Harlem only went to the Upper East Side to serve as maids and porters for these rich people. As planners, 
we had the money to build a market. And the question was, do we do it at the center or at the edge, to, in the middle of Spanish Harlem or on the edge at 96th Street? And stupidly, I now think, we chose to put this communal resource in the center of the community because it was part of the identity of, so we thought, of Spanish Harlem. We would have done better to think about it as a kind of border territory where a lady in, in Mink going out for a late night um, quart of milk would stand next in line, maybe even to her own maid, but to somebody who was a lower class, a working class, Hispanic. Um, the reason we did that is that there was a um, strong impulse. Uh, the, the rich obviously wanted to have nothing to do with the poor, but there was a strong impulse among the poor that by centralizing the resources of a community, we strengthen its identity. So as I say, this is an example of something that I think went profoundly wrong. We should have put that market or a school, any other public health resource in between these two groups to give them a sense of being physically in this very ambivalent ambiguous space in which they'd have to notice each other, in which the, the activity of attending to people unlike yourself was stimulated and heightened. That's, that's a border condition. And that's something that in open systems, both mathematically, uh, in what are called fuzzy Venn diagrams, for instance, and urbanistically, define an open edge. I have to go on here. I see I'm very long-winded. Uh, the third aspect of an open city function is that it's dynamic rather than efficient. And this is probably the most important thing I could say to you, because many of you are techies. Um, a dynamic system has a lot of noise built into it. It's a system because of the very fact that things aren't fitting together neatly or that there are unresolved elements in it and so on, becomes uh, more and more uh, energized. We know this uh, uh, from the work of Melanie Mitchell on what she calls near chaos, which is a condition in which um, physical systems become more and more interactive, the less easily fitting they are together. And what Melanie has shown is that highly efficient systems tend in the end to self-degrade and are more entropic than systems which, in which there's a lot of conflict. Um, a simple way of, of thinking about this in terms of a city is if everything neatly fits together, nothing is going on. Whereas if things are in conflict with each other or unresolved, if there are parts of the city that don't fit easily together, there is more, just as there is in a physical system, there is more uh, interactivity and there's a higher degree of, of interaction, uh, the system is dynamic rather than efficient, it wards off entropy. I'll give you one uh, example of this as well. Um, in the way of, of thinking, which when I was a student dominated planning, you put one of everything in a distribution over the whole city. Say you had a thousand diamond merchants in Berlin. You'd spread those diamond merchants out so that each had its own territory. Uh, you know, its local footfalls and so on. That is a recipe for killing off the uh, retail diamond merchants. What you want to do is densify them together 
so that they're competing, they're, they're gossiping, they're interacting, they're fighting each other, and they're also collaborating with each other. Uh, it's a basic principle about uh, fighting entropy, which is the more density you have, the more overlapping um, groups, the less rationalized, the more that you're going to create a stimulating uh, environment. And for most of the history of cities, that's been the case. It's why people who sell the same sort of uh, things tend to club together rather than spread out evenly. This is particularly true in the developing world. Saskia and I were recently in um, Delhi, which has the biggest open-air um, electronics market in the world called Nehru Place. And uh, there seem to be, uh, I couldn't count them, but there must be thousands of people who very conveniently have uh, just found a box of red iPhones or uh, 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 headphone sets and so on. It's all gray area commerce. Uh, I eat to you semi-legal commerce. And these are people who don't have stores, they just have overturned boxes in, in this Nehru place, it's a huge open air market. The sides of Nehru pay, place are startup people who frequently go out for a USB from who's ever selling. It looks like it should be very self-destructive. But in fact, in this informalized market, the fact that all these people are together is, means that the market is growing faster than if they were rationally spread out. So that's the third aspect of an open system. It's dynamic rather than efficiently distributed. And now I come to the question which I began with which is how do, what's the role of smart cities in this, high tech, we're capable of? Many of you will know that many of the analysts of the internet and um, particularly people at the um, Oxford Internet Institute have argued that in the last 20 years, uh, the internet and more generally high-tech, but particularly the internet, has been moving from an open to a closed system. On the one hand, that's, that's embodied in the fact that there are fewer and fewer players. You know, Google is swa either swallows people up, if, if they're startups and owns them, or it shuts them down. The idea is to have less and less competition. This is an age, the Oxford people argue, in which monopoly, which used to dominate the industrial manufacturing sector, now dominates the high-tech sector. And that's basically closing down the, high t uh, the uses of high-tech. It's becoming a closed system. For us in urbanists, this, this kind of work has a particular resonance because what we're seeing is more and more standardized forms of uh, things like traffic control systems, uh, uh, some kinds of underground heating systems for, um, for use of, of uh, deep well water and so on, that there are fewer and fewer options being sold to us by fewer and fewer firms. So just as the, you, you know, uh, an open system on the web originally was something like Linux, where you could do a lot of adaptation, you could write your own code and so on, and you still can do that um, wonderfully. And if I can learn Linux, anybody can learn it. Uh, what you're having now is something more like the Google um, kernel applied to urban systems. They're becoming more and more standardized. They, they parallel more and more core investment. 
And the real sinner in this is uh, IBM, which is reducing the options of the systems that cities can buy to manage uh, big data. Of course, that's only part of the story. Uh, the advent of the handheld, some people have argued, is also a way in which smart cities are closing down the city. That is, when you look at Google Maps, you're not making a discovery. You're not gi being given a lot of options. You're being told what is the most efficient way to get from A to B. And that's probably fine for a map. But the same thing is occurring in other domains in which handhelds are being used. For instance, you can get an app that tells you how to navigate the city um, safely. Surprise, the answer to that is that the app shows you how to avoid, in the United States cities, black people. And in Britain, where the Muslims are. Right? It's the same principle. Right? The most efficient way to be safe is to have somebody else do it for you. Um, and in general, what we're seeing is a kind of model of mobility, of traffic mobility, being applied to lots of other kinds of social um, experience. And what this means is that rather than this technology enabling people giving them more opportunities to find, for instance, you, I don't know how you would, with a handheld, say, find me the nearest um, uh, border. You know, you, ca you can't write that into the system at present. You could, you know, what's the equivalent of 96th Street? You could do that if you wanted to. The technology allows it, but the mindset of using it discriminates and represses against it. So my beef with current smart city technology is not the technology itself. It's the fact that it's intersected with an economic system which is closing things down uh, in a way which is disabling a fundamental property of all human cognition, which is inductive reasoning from uh, particular circumstances. That's the heart of an open system, that induction is difficult. It's difficult because it's ambiguous, you're dealing with complex data that's not neatly bounded, uh, you're dealing with a dynamic rather than uh, a, a system in equilibrium uh, uh, that's efficient. You're dealing with something that requires intelligence. And what is happening to me with the smart system world now is that that kind of induction, open induction, is being dismantled by these kind of corporate, uh, f corporatizing forms of closed use of technology. So what I would like and what I'm trying to figure out in my book, I don't have the answer to this yet maybe you'll tell me what it is, is how we can think about the uses of big data, uh, uh, GIS systems, all of the wonderful uh, tech tools that we have to open up the city, to reverse this process of monopolization and to put it not too, not too fine a point about it. The smart cities that we're getting now are stupefying. You don't have to think about being in them. And we want something that in, in fact is, is, makes people smarter, not stupider. So that is a kind of problematic I'm thinking about now. And um, um, maybe you'll solve it for, for me. So in sum, what I've tried to describe to you is a contrast between open and closed city. Closed city is a phenomenon of modern capitalism. It has economic, it also has social consequences. The open city 
is something that uh, is not an ideal. There are elements of open system cities in the past. There are open. There are parts of open syst uh, uh, open cities um, in in many many places. It's not an either or thing. But the open system is vulnerable today to the closed system. Cities are becoming less open and more closed. And in that process, the the the, um, the frightening thing is that we're abusing technology by making it a kind of handmaiden of closure rather than openness. Thank you very much. Now, we're supposed to have some questions. Tell me what's wrong with this. I mean, you've been such a good audience for 45 minutes. Hands going up. Can we have a microphone in the front row, please? Do you have to ask me in English, or somebody will have to make an Ibrizetzen. Uh, Ibrizetzen? I'm yeah. right here? Yeah. OK, you're up next. Don't worry. Hello, and thank you for this wonderful talk. My name is Martin Schmidt from the Center for Contemporary History. And I just was wondering, uh, could you uh, strongen the point, what is new about this uh, at open systems in, open, uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, smart cities? Because if you look, for example, at the apartheid regime, who built up these cities in the 1970s, 1980s, especially with well, uh, with, with plans um, separating uh, classes. And uh, so this isn't such a new uh, think, way of thinking, while especially in the 1960s, 1970s, the whole thing of cybernetics and um, system thinking developed. So, if you strongen the point a bit. So, the question about this is, what's new about this kind of closure? Is that your question? Yes. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, I think there are several things that are new about it. One is that these are uh, not endogenous closures. That is, they're not imposed from within. They're in, in economic terms, they're imposed from without. One aspect of core investing is that the one place sensitivity that people have is to investing in a neighborhood which is, out, which is an edge rather than a, a, a center. And, uh, and, uh, an uh, exogenous investor, that's called a global investor, who doesn't live there, is going to do that as a way of protecting and stabilizing the investment. That's part of what's new. I mean, globalization uh, created new kinds. It's segregation. You're absolutely right. You know, the effect of it is that, you know, uh, um, whites are living far from blacks in the township, uh, in the old townships. But they're doing that for a different reason. Uh, when the apartheid regime, for instance, was built up in South African cities, it was local white investors who were doing that. Now it's people who are indifferent to that. It's just a matter of cash. I would also say here that technology also makes a big difference. Um, and I, I'm jumping over your question, but I just want to say this. One of the horrible illusions in the tech world about the relation of tech and cities is something called the death of distance. You all know about this, Manuel Castell's idea, distance no longer matters, so on, it can be anywhere, you know, so on. This isn't true. If that were true, uh, investors would be um, snapping up, um, well, no, let me put it that way. 
If that were true, what you would have is kind of process of additive growth in which you just added more and more stuff randomly and indiscriminately. And as you'll hear from Saskia tomorrow, territory is not organized that way. It's a highly selective process of expulsion and addition. Uh, if the death of distance were true, basically you'd have a neutralized space for investment. But that's, it's simply not the case. Um, and for the kinds of apps I've been looking at, you know, like how to stay safe, i.e. avoid the blacks or avoid the Muslims, the distance is everything on that. It's all a calculation of distance, of social distance. So I think that's, a, the, that's another aspect of, um, of why there's something new here. Uh, can I just say one more thing? I'm terribly long-winded. <laughs> um, about the open city part of this, the idea of this is nothing original to me. Aristotle in the politics says, a city cannot be made of similar people. A city is composed of different kinds of people. And the term he uses for that is synoikosmos, bringing together different kinds of clans from which the word synergy also derives. And it's a very fragile thing throughout most urban histories whether the, that kind of open condition is going to survive or not. It tends to survive when cities are growing economically and to fall apart and entropy take over when cities are, are, are in a process of economic uh, decline. If you think about Venice, Venice was a synoikosmos, a real a complicated one, but a real synoikosmos of people from all over the world trading and working there until about 1600. And then it becomes less dynamic it becomes more well organized and the traders begin to leave or as in the case of the Jews, they're, they're, um, uh, they're ghettoized, they have, you know, you have more and more separation and rationalization of the city. So this is a process, it, this is true in, uh, it was a true in, in uh, uh, cities of Latin America as it is in Europe. Um, so the issue about this is that there's a kind of closure occurs when a kind of rationalizing of difference takes, takes precedence over a kind of dynamic interaction. And it's just a long, long history in cities. Let's have another. Let's take one more question over here. In your talk, you were referring to the players who drive closed systems or closed cities. How can, we, how can we identify the drivers of open systems, of open cities, and how can we empower them? Thank you. So the question is, how can we identify what drives an open uh, system? I'll give you... Uh, an example that we're living right now of that. In my view, the reason why all these refugees are good for us is not that they're a young labor force who can mean that elderly whites like me can retire on pensions, which I'm sure you've heard that from many people. Uh, and not that they're middle class uh, at least the Syrians, so that they're really sort of like us. For me, the thing about that is that uh, that is a driver of opening up the society to think about relations of difference between us and them. Uh, that it's a fundamental uh, way, the presence of refugees and foreigners is a fundamental way 
in which societies think about what they're about. Now, they can be very bad, you know, is that these people aren't like us, we don't want them. But one of the things that seems to be the case sociologically is that the more that you mix refugees and exiles in, in reasonable numbers, with uh, established people already in a city of different religion or class or whatever, is that gradually, for those in the city, they're the so-called natives, that their attitudes become much more open and they become much more uh, tolerant. The same thing is true in the workplace. And this, I say this too as an American, it was when I was a boy in the 1950s, it was thought that blacks and whites could never work together on the same, in the same shop or in the same factory. And they were, they were segregated. Uh, in Chicago, where I grew up, the stockyards, you know, where the animals were processed, were rigidly segregated. Lo and behold, once the law obliged these two groups to mix, the attitude of the white workers, you know, those supposedly neo-fascist, you know, fearful white working class, suddenly changed. You know, they might have still been racist in the abstract, but, you know, Joe so-and-so is working next to you who's black. He's not like them. And that's a way in. So my notion about this, I maybe shocking to you, but my notion is that we need to have enforced integration, both residentially and also in the labor force. And that less draconian, and in schools, you know, it's, uh, we need to force people uh, to be with people who are unlike themselves. We need to force them to do that kind of border work as a, a 96th Street, you know. And I think that's a driver of openness. I don't, one thing I would not say about what I'm arguing is that people spontaneously are going to open themselves up. Certainly that's not true in the cities that, uh, most cities that, the big complicated cities. You need a state, you need a law that obliges people to do the kinds, to have the kinds of experiences which will change their behavior as well as their attitudes. So, um, I, um, I know this may sound very contentious. There's a generation of urbanists who came before me, like Jane Jacobs in the United States, believed that people spontaneously were open and it was only the system that was sitting down on them. That's too simple. An open system requires structure. It requires law. It requires force, even. Uh, but the results of it, of applying that kind of force or that kind of law, is, I think, to, to provide a kind of change in behavior and belief. Um, now, you know, in Britain, we look at you Germans. You may think that you're, this has been a disaster what's happened to you. For most people in Britain, they look and with incredible admiration to what's happened in Germany here the last year. We only take 5,000 refugees a year in principle, and so far we've taken from Syria about 322. That's a closed society, you know? All the languages, toleration, integration, and so on, but there's nothing that is a uh, there's no legal force saying, okay, we should do our share, we should take 80 or 90,000 uh, uh, refugees this year. So what I'm saying about, and people are very content with that in Britain, they're very content not, not to have any refugees come. So if were I prime minister, an unlikely event, let me tell you, uh, I would take in 80 or 90,000. I would do, I, I admire Mrs. Merkel for doing that. And eventually, I think those attitudes will change if instead of segregating immigrants, 
or refugees, you actually bring them into places where they wouldn't normally be. That's what an open system does. It creates noise, you know? It creates tension. And that's what opens people up, not comfort. So. Thank you so much, Richard. We are so, so thrilled and honored to have you here. It's fantastic. And we also very much look forward to Saskia Sassen's talk tomorrow here on stage one. Thank you very much to both of you for being here.